Welcome today in the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here once again in our beautiful sanctuary here at St. Andrew United Methodist Church here in St. Albans, West Virginia. And if this happens to be your first time tuning in with us, we are glad that you've chosen to join us. We hope that you are blessed to be with us today. Each week, in addition to our Sunday message, there's an opportunity for you to get connected with our small group ministry. We meet at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings through Zoom. And so if you'd be interested in meeting with us to reflect and to discuss the content of this week's message, um, then all you need to do is contact the church office and share that you'd like to be added to our church mail- emailing list, and you'll get the link and all the information that you need, the invitation to come to our Zoom meeting. For those of you who are St. Andrew members and those who worship with us, I also want to encourage you to use this as an opportunity to be connected. I realize this is not necessarily the ideal way of of doing things, but it's still important and it's still our responsibility to make sure that we are being connected in our relationships. And our Wednesday evening small group is one of those opportunities to do that. It's an opportunity for us to continue to nurture our spiritual lives as well as fellowship with one another. So we hope that you'll, you'll join us this coming Wednesday. What I'd like to do now is offer a pastoral prayer for you, and then I'm going to read the scripture for today and offer the message. Let's go to God in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for your presence in our lives through your Holy Spirit who unites us together as the church, your people, the body of Christ on earth. We thank you for the gifts that you've given each of us. And we pray that in this time of uncertainty that you would empower us to love and serve one another in the ways that we can. That we would encourage each other and support and that we would do all that is within our power to show your love to one another and to the world. We ask that you would bless the people in our congregation and our community. That as we face various needs of different situations that are going on, that we would be able to trust you in our lives, whether it's sickness or whether it's facing surgeries or treatments, or, Lord, if it's even facing death, we pray that your peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and Christ Jesus. We pray that, Lord, that you would help us and, and our community as we try to discern ways to move forward, that you would give us wisdom and guidance. We pray for the leaders of our country, the leaders in our state and in our community. We pray for those who are the most vulnerable, those who are in need, those who might not know where their next meal is coming from. We pray for the children, not only in our community, but around the world. There's so much going on, so much that is difficult to understand. I pray that you will keep them safe, help them to know that they are loved and cared for. And Lord, in the opportunities that we have, help us to be your hands and your feet, to shine our light and to show the presence of Christ in the world. And now together as your people, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The title of this week's message is Tangible Jesus. And we continue in our sermon series in 1 John. Our scripture reading today is 1 John Chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Will you hear these words? We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
this life was revealed. And we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Last week I shared with you that it was going to be kind of a two-part series. That last week's message wasn't going to make sense unless you watched it in light of this week's message. And if you tuned in last week, you'll remember that I talked about how through the ages, the people of God have perceived God and understood God and used different images and descriptions of, of God that are quite limited. And I talked about how on one hand, that's totally fine. Because as human beings, we are finite creatures. And it's really difficult for us to wrap our minds around God who is infinite, who is transcendent. But on the other hand, it's also important for us to remember and be aware of our limitations. That all of our descriptions, all of our images, all of our perceptions of who God is are ultimately inadequate because we're really just scratching the surface. And all of these ideas, all of these expressions are, they, they expose our human limitations. We bottle God up and we make God simple. And so we focused on the passage in 1 John last week that talks about God is love. And that when we get to the New Testament, there are these images of God that are boundless. Images of God that are unlimited. God is love. God is life. God is light. One of my favorite descriptions of God in the New Testament is in Acts 17, verse 28, when Paul is preaching to the most intellectual people of his day in Athens, Greece. And in order to describe God, he quotes the words from a Greek poet, saying, in God we live and move and find our very being. Now that's some deep stuff. In God we live and move and find our very being. So the question that I want to ask today is how is this God who is transcendent, this God who is mysterious and infinite, how is God revealed to us? And the simple answer is Jesus of Nazareth. Now, before I can really jump into the text today, I got to do a little bit of background material here, and it's going to get kind of deep, but I promise that if you stick with me, I think it'll be worth it. So, biblical scholars, many biblical scholars believe that 1 John was written after the Gospel of John. Maybe we might think of it as an explanation or a commentary. And the theory goes like this, that the Gospel of John was originally written to a group of Christians who lived in Ephesus. And we can't underestimate the importance of Ephesus in early Christianity. Just when we look at the New Testament, we find 
that in Paul's missionary journeys, he spent more time in Ephesus than any other city. It was the Roman capital of Asia Minor, and there are estimates that their population had as many as 200,000 people, which was quite a big city in antiquity. It's still a pretty good-sized city today. Not only did Paul spend a a considerable amount of time there in his missionary journeys, but we know that he wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus. And then Timothy, to whom Paul wrote the pastoral letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy. It's believed that he was either a, past, a pastor or a bishop over the churches that were there in Ephesus. And last but not least, the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, there is this short letter to the church in Ephesus. So we really can't underestimate the kind of influence that the church in Ephesus would have had in the rest of Christianity. If they didn't get parts of the Christian faith right, it was going to impact the rest of the world. And so it was important for John to clarify some of the things that they misunderstood from the gospel of John. The church in Ephesus, they they received the gospel of John, they read it, they absorbed it, they loved it, but there was something that they must have misunderstood. Now, something else we know about the Gospel of John, it's not completely unrelated, but it can be substantiated based upon other historical facts, uh, is that it wasn't received quite as early as Matthew, Mark, and Luke when the church was putting together the New Testament. The church was a little bit cautious when it came to the Gospel of John because for at least the first two centuries, the primary readers of the Gospel of John was a group of people in the ancient world who were known as Gnostics. We don't know a whole lot about Gnostics or Gnosticism, but we know enough to kind of put together a few of the pieces. We know that Gnostics, they believed that the material world was evil, that it was bad, and that the spiritual world was good. And so the ultimate goal in life was to be liberated from the physical world, to be set free in the spiritual realm. And they believed that the way that this would happen would be through knowledge, some kind of special knowledge, special revelation. And the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis, Gnosticism. And it appears that perhaps some Gnostics were reading the Gospel of John and they liked it, but they were trying to adapt certain ideas to their philosophy. And as you can imagine, they probably had some problems with this idea in John chapter 1 of the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us because they believe that the physical world is bad and the spiritual world is evil or the spiritual world is good. So for them, it was incomprehensible to think of God taking on human form. And so one of the earliest Gnostic heresies that made its way into Christianity was something called Docetism. And Docetism comes from the Greek word dakeo, which means to seem. And the idea was that Jesus seems like a human. He has all the appearances of being a human, but he's not really. He's just a spiritual being. And it appears that as John is writing to this church to clarify some of their misunderstandings, that he wants to make it perfectly clear that Jesus was a physical person. And so if you listen closely to the scripture lesson today, you heard John say, that the purpose of writing about, writing this letter to them was to talk about the one who is from the beginning, who they have 
heard with their ears and seen with their eyes and touched with their hands. John is talking about tangible Jesus. One of the most influential Gnostics was this guy named Marcion who lived in the second century. And he's the first person to put together uh, what we might think of as a New Testament, but he excluded several of the, the books that we find in the New Testament. And one of Marcion's theories was that Jesus was never really born. He didn't grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. He didn't experience childhood or adolescence. Instead, for lack of a better way of putting it, Jesus just kind of magically appeared in Galilee at the age of 30. Because for Gnostics, for people like Marcion, it was just inconceivable, incomprehensible to think of the Word becoming flesh and joining the human story. But for John, all oh, this is imperative. This is important to understanding who Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, is. He's a tangible Jesus. And so the narrative of Jesus that we have loved and embraced is the story of his mother carrying him for nine months. And he was born to the same ways that you and I were, natural birth. Jesus came into the world and he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. And there's a story in the New Testament that when Jesus was 12, he went with his parents to the Passover, to the temple, and he got lost while he was there. And then we don't hear about Jesus again until he's 30 years old. And it makes me wonder if he got in so much trouble when he was 12 that his mom sent him to his room for 18 years. And that's why we didn't hear about him again. That's a joke, by the way. But then at the age of 30, Jesus traveled from Galilee into the wilderness of Judea where he was baptized in the Jordan River. And subsequently, he began his public ministry. He walked along the Sea of Galilee with the sand beneath his feet and the water at his toes. And he spent his time with fishermen riding in a boat. And Jesus, he ate with sinners and tax collectors and Gentiles. Jesus ate physical food. In fact, Jesus must have eaten so much he gained the reputation of being a drunk and a glutton because Jesus loved to sit down and eat with people who were disenfranchised and marginalized. Jesus healed people by picking up mud and spitting on it and rubbing it in their eyes. And some of these parts of tangible Jesus, they make us a little bit uncomfortable. And that's why in Christian art we see pictures of, of Jesus with a halo around his head or maybe it looks like he's levitating a few inches off the ground. But the story of the gospel is that God has chosen to join the human story to walk on earth and tangible Jesus. And Paul in his letter to the Philippians even talks about this. In Philippians chapter 2, he, he narrates this mystery of the incarnation by, by saying that Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself. And this Greek word, kenosis, has opened up this entire doctrine of what does that mean for him to empty himself. And I think that means that Jesus voluntarily laid aside certain divine attributes to take on the form of a servant and to join us on earth as tangible Jesus. For John, 
This mystery of the incarnation was so important for the church in Ephesus to get right that he had to write them another letter to follow up and explain that we saw him, we heard him, and we touched him with our hands. This is how God is revealed. This mysterious, transcendent being that is beyond our comprehension. And isn't it wonderful that God didn't reveal God's self through a list of rules or through more rituals? God is revealed instead in a person, intangible Jesus, in a relationship. The Word who has made flesh and dwelt among us. And this story, the story of Jesus' life, it's, it's all about love. And in John 3, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is how God has shown love, by giving it reminds us that, that love is a verb, that love is an action, that love is something that is tangible. We get to know who God is through Jesus Christ. And the ways that we show God in the world are the same ways that Jesus showed God in the world through tangible acts of love through serving, bringing hope and healing by sitting down with people who are left out and welcoming them to the table. And yet right now we feel challenged by all of that with social distancing because we're not supposed to touch each other right now. We can't do that. We're kind of limited in the ways that we can engage with the public and with our community. And so right now, I believe that God is calling us to find ways, find new ways to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in the world. If you're like me, I thought that the pandemic was going to last for maybe six or eight weeks that it was going to be over and that we were just going to kind of go right back to normal. But the more that I'm learning is that we're going to need to adjust to a, a new kind of normal, which means that as the body of Christ, we're going to have to adjust to new ways of doing ministry. We can't just give up and we can't just sit down, but we're going to have to figure out something else. And to be quite honest with you, I don't have all the answers. It's going to take all of us working together. It's going to take all of us putting our minds together to figure out how do we be the hands and the feet? How do we represent the tangible Jesus in the world through social distancing? I can think of a couple of things. In John's letter, he begins by saying that Jesus was seen and Jesus was heard. And that Jesus was touched. We know that we can't touch each other. We can't hug each other. But we can see each other. We can hear each other. And one of the great ministries that our church has going on right now is we have a team of people who are calling the members in our congregation to check on them on a regular basis just to see how things are going. This would be a great way and a great opportunity for you to serve right now to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in a real, tangible kind of way. We also have people in our congregation who are making masks. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't have one. I wouldn't really know where to get one. This is a service. If you have this kind of a skill set, you might want to touch base with the church office to see how you might be able to help. We have people in our congregation who have offered to go to the grocery store if anyone needs groceries picked up. And this is a way to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, 
to represent tangible Jesus in the world. And just today, I got a a text message from some of our youth and young adults who want to make some baked goods, some cookies and some homemade bread to deliver to people who just need a little bit of encouragement. There's a way we can organize this and get this going. It's already in place. And it's time for us to figure out ways that we can that we can serve outside of the box. God is calling us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ during this unique time. I also think that we face another challenge. And that is most of us are experiencing other people through a computer screen or a screen on our television. And right now, our nation is so incredibly divided. And it seems like it's getting easier and easier to dehumanize people who are on the other side of the screen. People who disagree with us, who think differently than we do. To call them names. To think of them as less than human And all of us were under more stress than usual trying to navigate these strange times. And I think that God is calling us to remember that when we see people on TV from other nations or people who represent different ideologies than us, God is calling us to remember that they are tangible people. (laughs) People who have feelings. People who are created in the image of God. And that in this, this time where we're experiencing some fear and some uncertainty that maybe we need to stop. Maybe we just need to pause. Maybe we need to turn off our TV. Maybe we need to limit our amount of time on social media to remember that every single person is created in the image of God. That Jesus came to love them and show God's love. For them too. In conclusion, I want to think about one final idea, image here. There was a, a scholar, a theologian by the name of Henry Nouwen. He was a brilliant Roman Catholic. And he discovered as a kind of in a senior citizen, I, I would think, and uh, maybe in his 50s, that he had kind of spent too much of his life in isolation. Too much of his life in the ivory towers, away from the tangible world. And as he spent time in prayer and reflection, he realized that God was calling him to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in a new way. And so this brilliant theologian, packed up, left behind his life of scholarship and spent the rest of his days working in a convalescent home, wiping the mouths of people who could not feed themselves and bathing them. And as Henry described his spiritual life and what was really driving him in his uh, his writings in a book called The Wounded Healer, he talks about The Christ in him, recognizing the Christ in others. And I believe that's a beautiful description of what we are supposed to do as followers of Jesus, regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, in the world. That the Christ who we are nurturing in our own lives, our own spiritual journey through reading scripture and joining together in small group studies and through prayer and reflection. That this Christ who lives within us is able to identify the Christ in other people. The people that we serve the people that we disagree with, the people that we don't particularly like, the people who are different than us. And that's what this whole journey of discipleship is about, that we nurture the Christ within us so much that that we see Christ in everyone else. 
And so may we, as the followers of Jesus, figure out during this time, what is it going to look like for us to be his hands and his feet? To go into the world to bless other people as Jesus has blessed us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and how you speak to us. And I pray that your spirit will work in our hearts and our lives to shape us, to make us more like Christ so that we will see Christ in others. May that be the driving force of all that we are and all that we do. Lead us and guide us now through the power of your Holy Spirit. For it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. And may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.